Good morning, everybody. My name is Kendra Jackson. I'm one of the Peds Emergency Medicine Fellows at Carolina's Medical Center in Charlotte, North Carolina. And today we're gonna to talk about pediatrics in the emergency department. I love emergency medicine because we are the safety net. We get to take care of everybody. Doesn't matter how old you are, if you have insurance, if you have money, even not have an emergency. All you need is to be afraid and need help and I can help you. We can't say no and we get to provide care for those who otherwise wouldn't receive care. And so our objectives today, we are going to discuss a broad differential diagnosis for febrile neonates. We're going to talk about normal neonatal vitals and then discuss the standard workup of a sick versus not sick neonate. And so why do we care about fevers in the neonatal period? Well, babies who are less than two months old haven't got their first round of vaccines. Their blood brain barrier is not fully matured and they're at increased risk for meningitis. And babies, unfortunately, um, if they're not getting breast milk, they're not getting IgGs from their mom on a regular basis and are dependent on the IgG that was transferred during the third trimester across the placenta. And so because babies under two months old don't have a fully robust immune system, they're at increased risk for serious bacterial illnesses. And so a fever of 100.4 or greater in an infant less than two months old is concerning. Ideally, we'd like that temperature to be measured rectally, but if a mom or dad came in with a axillary temperature of 100.4 or an oral temperature of 100.4 or greater, I would still be concerned and, and consider workup. And so why do we worry about babies specifically? They are so great at compensating. Babies will compensate, 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 and then fall off the edge of the cliff unlike adults where it's kind of a slower progression. Babies can look great one minute and the next be critically ill. And so majority of babies who are febrile in the less than two months old likely have a viral infection, likely have something that they are going to fully recover from and have no long-term sequelae. But our job as emergency medicine physicians is to be sensitive, to find that needle in a haystack, that one baby out of a million, that less than 0.05% of febrile neonates who have meningitis, it's our job to find those kiddos. And it's our job to find more common things like urinary tract infection, which is about 10% of febrile neonates less than two months old. And so when you have a baby come in who's less than two months old and is febrile, I want you to think sepsis, 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 bacteremia, whether that be from group B strep, from the baby being born vaginally, getting inoculated by mom's vaginal flora. GBS, group B strep can cause severe, severe sepsis. And babies in the beginning of their course of illness might look totally fine. Viremia from a virus like flu or HSV, I want that to be on your differential. Urinary tract infection, when you're sitting for hours in a diaper, stool can easily go from the bottom to the front and inoculate the urethra and cause a urinary tract infection. Or babies who have dilated renal pelvics with hydronephrosis are at increased risk for UTI. We will see those kiddos present in the newborn period. Meningitis, like we've discussed, that blood brain barrier not being mature, pneumonia, we need to be thinking about, and osteo. Osteomyelitis in a new newborn might look like a fussy baby who's not eating well and no longer moving their right arm. That needs to be a cause for a concern. And something that's equally important to be on our differential is abdominal catastrophe. Unfortunately, we missed this. So we need to be thinking about. Is there dead bowel somewhere in this baby? Is this baby inconsolable, uncomfortable, vomiting, not passing stool? 
having a distended abdomen, we need to be thinking about abdominal catastrophe. The most common in the neonatal period is neck, necrotizing enterocolitis, where bacteria from the lumen of the intestines translocates into the lining of the intestines and can spread to the, the bloodstream and throughout the body. These babies present with abdominal distension and pneumatosis in the lining of the intestines on abdominal x-ray. These babies are more likely to have been born premature, to be formula fed. And they can present with fussiness and fever. So let that be on your differential as well as malrotation and volvulus. Bowel twisting on itself and having decreased blood flow can absolutely present in as a febrile neonate. And then our most common differentials, viral bronchiolitis, inflammation of the lower airway tree from a virus like RSV or COVID or the flu, or just a regular URI, upper respiratory infection because their sibling goes to daycare and kids love to share their germs. So be thinking of viral infections on your differential and mucocutaneous infections. Um, newborns are at increased risk for getting STIs from their mom. So syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, these babies can present with gunky eyes and fever, with rash and fever, with fussiness and fever. So be thinking about those on your differential and asking mom about infections during the pregnancy. Omphalitis and cellulitis. Omphalitis is a severe, serious, high morbidity, high mortality infection of the umbilicus as well as the soft tissue surrounding it. It can be caused by MRSA and MSSA. So be looking head to toe on these babies and making sure that you have mucocutaneous infections on your differential. And so a big thing that we need to do uh, whenever we walk into a room, we need to say, is this neonate sick? or not sick. And that will be key on your pediatric emergency medicine rotation. And that separates kind of the people who are in tune and instinct and the ones who are not self-aware. The way we can tell a sick versus not sick baby is the pediatric vitals. Now, pediatric vitals are a moving target and I know it is hard to remember. So we're gonna talk about normal newborn vitals today and hopefully you can use those on your rotation. So respiratory rate. A normal newborn less than two months old can breathe 24 to 50 times a minute and be completely comfortable. And when babies are really worked up and really angry, they're fussy because they're hungry, they poop themselves, they're wet, they can get respiratory rates up to 60. The difference between a sick versus a not sick baby is the baby who is sick is not going to accept the, the pacifier. They're not going to calm down when the mom soothes them. They're not going to calm down when they get their bottle. So those are the babies I want you to be concerned about. Greater respiratory rates, greater than 50 when they're not crying, or even when they're crying, they're not able to be consoled. Those are the babies we think, hmm, could be sick. Heart rate. The normal heart rate for a newborn is between 100 and 160, but can get up to 200 with being crying and being fussy. And so the babies who are sick are gonna stay high in 180, 190. We've consoled them, they look calm and they're still tachycardic, that is a sick baby. And usually tachycardia is the first sign of sepsis of severe bacterial illness in babies. So be thinking tachycardic baby, greater than 160, not crying, not consolable, think sick. Hypotension. Now, normal blood pressure is really hard to discuss in neonates because there are a lot of size variation, but the biggest thing I want you to do is be able to recognize hypotension. In a fresh baby who is less than 96 hours old, I might see a systolic blood pressure of 65 and not get too worried, but less than 60, that is hypotension. For a baby that's greater than 96 hours old and they have a systolic 
blood pressure of 65, I'm worried about hypotension. So hypotensive baby, not a good thing, sick. The next thing I want you to think about is sick versus not sick. I want you to think about your exam and your ABCs. A baby who is, has a patent airway is crying, is, might be cooing. A baby who is obstructed might have <laughs> strider with every breath in or every breath out. They might have grunting <laughs> with each breath in, making us concerned, hey, this baby is sick. Their airway is not where we want it to be. This is a kid I need to talk to my attending about. Looking at the breathing, is this baby calmly breathing, sometimes fast, sometimes slow, which is common in newborns, especially during sleep, paradoxical breathing, or is this baby every breath in, you can see their ribs. Every breath in, <gasps> you can see supraclavicular strider, or, you're not seeing the baby's chest rise symmetrically on each side. That's a baby that's sick and needs help right away. And then circulation. Is this a nice brown, mocha, pink, tan baby? Or is this baby mottled? Is this baby gray? Is this baby a lot lighter than both parents? We need to be concerned about circulation and thinking this might be a sick baby. If you push on the toe and you release, it takes about four or more seconds for the, for the pink or the coloration to return. That is concern for delayed cap refill and that is a sick baby. And so just to review, we're thinking about our airway, we're thinking about our breathing, and we're thinking about our circulation and that will help us determine is this a sick versus not sick baby. For our management, of course, if a baby is in respiratory distress, we need to help them breathe. If they're not taking good deep breaths, we need to support their breathing with oxygen and pressure support. If their circulation isn't good, we're gonna give them fluids, we're gonna give them pressors. And so after we manage our ABCs, we need to think about sepsis management, which is usually fluid resuscitation. A tachycardic baby or a hypotensive baby needs fluids from us to help increase that blood flow to the brain, to the lower extremities, to the kidneys, to help that baby recover from their infection. And then we need to be thinking about broad spectrum antibiotics and antivirals in babies who are less than 21 days old or per your attending's preference. Usually a septic workup in a neonate will um, include, for babies less than two months old, will include blood cultures, a CBC, a CMP, and we need to look at the liver function and we'll talk a little bit about more about why we need those. We're gonna look in the urine for nitrates, for leucesterase. We're gonna send the urine for culture. We're gonna get a lumbar puncture and most neonates looking for signs of infection. The most important test that we're gonna get from the CSF is the culture because at the end of the day, if there's if I can send half a cc of CSF to the lab and it grows out of bacteria and I can get sensitivity on that antibiotic that I'm using, that's better than all the other information I could have gotten from that CSF. The next most important thing is our cell count. We're gonna look for white blood cells. We're gonna look for red blood cells. That helps us determine is this high likelihood of having a severe infection. If there's tons of white blood cells, I'm gonna be worried about meningitis. We're gonna look for glucose. If we have a low glucose, we're gonna be concerned for bacterial meningitis. In specific babies that we'll discuss in a minute, we'll look for HSV in the CSF. And lastly, and least importantly, we'll look for protein. High protein mm -hmm. is usually seen in babies who have viral meningitis. Mm -hmm. For babies who are having respiratory distress, we'll get a chest X-ray. If we see a lesion or a boil or an abscess or it's concerned for cellulitis, we might get 
skin swabs and skin cultures. In babies who have respiratory symptoms, tachypnea, nasal congestion, we might send off a viral panel. And in babies that were worried about herpes, we're going to get swabs head to toe looking for the virus in the eyes, in the mouth, the genitals, the umbilicus, in the rectum, and in the skin. I want you to think about herpes in babies who are less than two months old in the following situations. If you have elevated trans liver function enzymes, so your LFTs are through the roof, I want you to think, hmm, could this baby have herpes? Maybe I need to start this baby on acyclovir. If mom has a history of HSV, meaning she had gotten newly diagnosed with herpes during the pregnancy or had active lesions when the baby was born, absolutely we need to be thinking about HSV. For babies who present hypothermic, meaning their temperature is less than 36 degrees Celsius or less than 96.8, we're at higher suspicion for herpes and need to think about using acyclovir in these babies. Those who present with seizure-like activity with rhythmic jerking of their upper extremities with vesicular rashes, those are babies we need to think, is this herpes? And so we're gonna go through a case um, and talk a little bit more about workup and sick versus not sick. So our first case, we have a three-day-old male with a fever of 102.4, was discharged from the newborn nursery yesterday. He had some dark skin around his belly button yesterday, but this morning, mom and dad note that that swollen area and darkening area has extended across the abdomen. And so here's a picture of our baby. And mom and dad report that baby has had difficulty breastfeeding because he can't catch his breath. On your exam, baby is grunting with each breath. The respiratory rate is in the 60s. The heart rate is 190 and blood pressure of 78 over 54. Now, is this baby sick or not sick? And what is the diagnosis? So this baby is having difficulty breastfeeding. Can't catch his breath, okay? Is grunting. And when we look at the vitals, the respiratory rate is greater than 60, not good. And heart rate is 190, not good. So this baby is sick and has an infection called umphalitis. Now you might have seen umphalitis in um, lighter skinned children. This is what it looks like in darker skinned children. It can look more violaceous, dark, edematous. And you can see kind of that area of exudate coming out above the umbilicus, or it can look in a lighter skinned baby, cherry red, angry, swollen. And so if you have a baby that's sick and has umphalitis, the first thing you need to do is call for help. Now, when you're a med student, even when you're a resident, if you have a baby that is sick, you need to call for help right away. And here's my recommendations of how to kind of do that, to have a shared mental model so that everyone is on the same page and we can provide the best care. I will let the parents know, hey, because of how your baby's breathing, I'm gonna grab my supervisor so we can give your baby the best care without having to scare them, you can let them know, hey, I recognize something, I need to call for help, and I need to call for help so we can give your baby the best care. And how I want you to talk to your supervising resident or your fellow or your attending about it, be like, hey, I have a three-day-old in room five who's grunting and febrile, I'm concerned for sepsis. When you use that word sepsis, it will, shine a light in your attendee's eyes like, hey, this kid is sick. I need to go see them right away. You're letting them know how old they are. You're letting them know what room they're in, which is important and why you're concerned. And then 
Importantly, not, lastly, and not less important, is to let your nurse know. If that patient has a assigned nurse in the PDD, I want you, after you tell your supervising resident, fellow, attending, let your nurse know what's going on with that baby. Hey, I have a three-day-old in room five who's sick. I'm concerned for sepsis. Will you help us put the baby on monitors and get IV access? That way, everyone on the team, the parents, your supervisors, the nurse, all know what's going on and why we're concerned about this infant. And so for this baby, um, let's say we put our monitors on and the baby was setting 92% with stachypnic. I might try high flow nasal cannula to support that baby's worker breathing and provide some O2 and help support the baby and see how the baby's doing before I think about intubation, some other adjuncts to the airway. Our baby was tachycardic with a heart rate of 190, which is not normal for a newborn less than two months old. So I'm gonna give them a 20 mil per kilo bolus of normal saline. Before I give that, I'm gonna do a quick exam. I'm gonna listen to the lungs and say, do I hear any cardiac wheeze? Do I hear any fluid in those lungs? Okay, great. I'm gonna feel that baby's liver edge. Hey, is this baby have a huge liver that's all the way to the pelvis, no, awesome. And that'll say, hey, this is probably not a cardiac baby. This is probably just sepsis and I can give a normal 20 mil per kilo normal saline bolus. For babies with umphalitis specifically, we think about broad spectrum antibiotics. I will do cefepime because if you're sick, you're grunting, you're tachypnic, you're tachycardic, you have systemic symptoms and I'm gonna go for the big guns. I'm gonna do cefepime. I'm gonna make sure I cover for pseudomonas. I'm gonna use dentamycin and I'm gonna use vancomycin to cover for MRSA, MSSA and other superbugs. For our management, our workup, that baby is gonna get a blood culture, gonna get a CBC, gonna get a CMP, even though I have a focal infection, I'm still concerned about sepsis because I have a febrile baby less than two months old and I'm gonna do the full septic workup. I'm gonna get a urinalysis. I'm gonna get a urine culture. I'm gonna get a lumbar puncture. The most important thing that I send is gonna be the culture. And then I'm gonna send a cell count, a glucose and a protein if I can. This baby was in respiratory distress. So I'm gonna get a chest X-ray. I'm gonna look at the lungs. I'm gonna, because babies, unfortunately, you can have a cutaneous infection that can spread to bacteremia and seed other organs. And I wanna look, hey, do I have pulmonary edema? What's that cardiac silhouette look like? And then I wanna get a skin culture because even though omphalitis is usually poly, um, poly, microbiome, I'm still going to look to see if I can isolate a bacteria so I can manage and narrow my antibiotic coverage later while they're admitted. Our second case, we have a 45-day-old female with no past medical history presenting with nasal congestion and fever of 100.8. She's eating well, she's sleeping peacefully on your exam. Her respiratory rate is 35 and her heart rate is 140. Her blood pressure is 78 over 54. Is this a sick versus a not sick baby? And what is the likely diagnosis? And so our, our baby is eating normally, that's great. Is sleeping. This baby not only is adorable, but does look very calm. The respiratory rate of 35 is normal for a newborn, okay? The heart rate of 140 is normal, less than 160, greater than 100. And the blood pressure for a 45-day-old, that looks good as well. So this baby is not sick and likely has a viral URI. So the management for this baby we're still gonna do our ABCs. We're gonna say, hey, is this baby's nose 
making it hard for them to breathe, let's get some saline and do some suction so we can open up that airway and help that baby breathe. Sometimes babies have bronchiolitis, might have some mild retractions. We might give them a little bit of O2, a little bit of pressure support. And this baby, fortunately, because they're not sick, we're looking at the skin, we're making sure we don't see any signs of delayed cap refill or discoloration or cyanosis. Even in babies who are not sick and less than two months old, I'm still gonna give them broad spectrum antibiotics for a majority of them, especially those who are less than 21 days old and those who are greater than 20 day, 21 days old per your attending preference or your hospital's policy. For this baby, I'm gonna get a blood culture, a CBC, a CMP. I'm gonna get a urinalysis and a urine culture. I'm gonna look for inflammatory markers like procalcitonin and CRP. And the reason I get those is because babies, even though they're less than, they're greater than 21 days old, if they have high risk factors like a elevated CRP that's greater than 20, or procalcitonin that's greater than 10, they have an increased risk for serospectral illnesses and we might consider doing a lumbar puncture. We, in, if this baby had a vesicular rash or a history of herpes um, in the mom or was hypothermic on presentation, I'd get swabs head to toe. For this baby, since they have viral symptoms, I might get a viral panel because I want to know if this baby has COVID and needs to be quarantined. Um, if this baby started intermittently to kipnic, but when we suction their nose, they were calm, I might consider getting a chest x-ray. Likely for this baby, since they're comfortable, I would not. So in summary, I want you to think about neonatal fever. If babies are sick, I want you to call for help. I want you to look at the vitals. Are they tachypneic? Are they tachycardic? Are they hypotensive? If so, this is a baby I need to call for help. I'm gonna look at the ABCs. How's the airway? How's the breathing? How's the circulation? If that baby looks sick, I need to call for help. I need to call my, I need to let the family know what's going on. I need to call my supervising resident and I need to let my nurse know what's going on. In febrile neonates less than two months old, they still need a septic workup. They still need to get blood cultures and urine cultures, sometimes even lumbar punctures, depending on your attending's preference. Those babies less than 21 days old definitely need a lumbar puncture. Sick neonates less than two months old definitely need a lumbar puncture. And I want you to consider herpes in babies who are less than two months old and presenting with fever. Here are my references and my name is Kendra Jackson. Here's my email and my Instagram. I hope you guys have a fabulous day. Thank you so much for participating and listening to my talk.